being a, a black writer, being a black writer who'd worked in publishing, who is writing about publishing. Um, and I consciously, while I was writing, wanted to make sure I was not specifically throwing anyone under the bus because that was not what I wanted to be doing. And really wanting to make sure though that I was conveying the my genuine experience and my genuine, um, I mean, not literal genuine experience, but the, that just that, that weight and that kind of uh, environment with that does to someone was really my, my goal. Welcome to Book Reporter Talks To, where today's guest is Zakia Delia Harris, and we're going to be talking about her much anticipated, very anticipated novel, debut novel, The Other Black Girl, which is both a Good Morning America and a Barnes & Noble book club selection, and it's also an instant New York Times bestseller. So there's lots going on for this book. She's had a crazy couple of weeks with launch, and uh, welcome, Zakia. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to chat with you today. So looking forward to this. So let's start by your telling us about The Other Black Girl. Absolutely. So The Other Black Girl primarily follows a young 26-year-old editorial assistant named Nella Rogers. Um, Nella was born and raised in Connecticut in a suburb, uh, mostly around other white people. Um, and so uh, when she works at Wagner Books, it's a very prestigious, very white publishing house in Manhattan, also very, very white. Um, so she has been the only black person working at Wagner Books for the last two years, when another young black woman named Hazel, who was born and bred in Harlem, uh, starts working in the cubicle next to hers. And at first, Nella is so excited. She's like, yes, I have a friend. I have an ally, someone who gets it. Um, but it's never that easy uh, sometimes when you get a new coworker. And uh, Nella starts to wonder if Hazel, after a series of events at the office start to happen, um, if Hazel is really all that she seems. And at the same time, um, there are three other stories unfolding of three other Black women uh, who are all also tied to the world of media, the world of publishing. Um, and they're all bound by one very chilling, sinister secret that has implications for all four of the Black women in this book and Black people all over the world. It's it's a great synopsis. <laughs> it, really, it doesn't give anything away. You didn't give one word away about what's going on. I love that you got the idea for this book in all places, the ladies room. Okay. So tell us about that because I just think that is absolutely the funniest thing. You're in the ladies room. It's like, oh, here could be a career change for me. What's going on? <laughs> Ella. I know, right? It's where all dreams begin um, in the bathroom. <laughs> no, so um, yeah, it's funny too, because it's like, if I hadn't had this interaction in the bathroom, if I hadn't used the bathroom at that time, would this book have happened? All of those questions. Um, so uh, I worked, of course, in publishing myself. And uh, I'd been in publishing for about two and a half years or so when I was in the bathroom at work, washing my hands at the sink, and another Black woman came out of the stall next, no, or not next to me, but in the bathroom. And I looked at her and I was like, first of all, I knew she wasn't an author. I knew she wasn't an agent. Um, she had a work badge, I believe, which is why I was like immediately, she must be a new employee. She must be working here now. Um, and I tried to catch her eye, at least I think I did. Uh, tried to kind of, or at least in my head, had ideas of us being like, hey, like nodding at each other. Like, what's up? We're both in this very white publishing house. At the time, I was the only Black woman working in editorial. And so, you know, seeing her was really exciting. Um, but there's just no kind of acknowledgement, nothing. Maybe I wasn't pulling out, putting out enough feelers. I don't know, it's the bathroom. Uh, and I went back to my desk and I was more so thinking about really myself in that interaction. I didn't judge her at all for not talking to me again, bathroom, but I thought more about how I had been so hungry for an interaction. I thought about how I had been raised to not at other black people when we're in spaces like, uh, mostly white spaces or in places where we don't normally see other black people. Um, Cause that's just 
this is what we do. Um, and I thought about how I had been so for so long, the only one, um, or one of very, very few black people on the floor. Uh, there's one other black man who worked in the editorial. Uh, and just all of those feelings. I, I should add though that before that, I had already started moving toward thinking like, I don't wanna be here. I wanna be working on my own books instead of working on other people's books. But, but that interaction really set me off and I went back to my desk and I started writing chapter one in my cubicle. Wow, wow, I love it. <laughs> it's like, excuse me folks, I'm writing a book now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can't come to that meeting. I started yes. my novel. <laughs> There's a lot of conversation about race in this book, but there's also a lot of conversation about the entry level job and an assistant job brings camaraderie, competition, and you captured both. You captured both of what's going on. And I loved when you laid out the typical staff meeting where there's assistance alley, but also in assistance alley, there's some kind of a pecking order there. Of course, the assistants that have been there longer get different seats and things like that. What was the best part about being an assistant? Because there are those heady moments of being the assistant. They're so much fun, you know? I love that you asked this question because I feel like, like this book is like poster child for all that are not fun about being an editorial assistant. So thank you. The, the camaraderie, I think about just being in the trenches, um, working those hours, doing all of these jobs, because I think another thing about being an editorial assistant that a lot of people don't know and that I didn't know until I got in that position was that you really are doing everything. Like you are managing personalities, you're forward, uh, frontward facing, you're talking to people, you're making sure agents and everyone is satisfied, your bosses, but then you also are reading the books, you're giving notes, you're engaging, you're trying to think of, of course, new books that could be out in the world, right? And so I think all of those things can be a lot. And to have other people who get it, whose desks you can go to and just like moan and groan and get all of that out and move back to your task is something I, I loved and I really miss, frankly, now. Uh, I don't miss working in publishing, but I do miss having that kind of physical day-to-day -day contact with other peers. Yeah, it's that camaraderie. I worked at Condé Nast and I remember the assistant days and everybody would go out to so lunch. You know. We all had no money. We all had no money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I was making $9,100 a year. I feel like my first job. <laughs> oh my God. Like, it was just ridiculous. People talk about low salaries and let me tell you all low salaries. <laughs> but it is, there's this moment of you're all in the same boat together. And it's also then who's going to rise up out of the boat and what's going to end up happening. And I confess that I am finally watching the bold type on Hulu. Like I'm blitzing oh. through this show. And I I've only seen the first episode. So I, I know I need to watch. <laughs> it is it's so much fun because it's about that everybody's starting out in their career. And I'm at the point where some people are getting promoted and the other one goes, everybody's getting ahead. You're a director, you're hiring people. I'm not. And right. it, it's so much right. of that is what's going on. It reminds me of those totally. days. And totally. somebody gets a new job and you're like jealous and happy, a little more jealous. Totally, totally. Yeah. rat race. It's a rat race in a lot of ways. Yeah, totally, totally is. So you talked about the tension of race, something that's bubbling up and is being discussed in publishing in a much more public way. And beyond that, namely the lack of diversity and people of color that have just not been in prominent jobs in publishing. Was there something that you felt on an ongoing basis when you worked in publishing? Like, I know you felt like you were alone, but did you feel that if you went in and said, this is the way I see things or my friends see things or whatever, do you feel like you were listened to or do you feel like it was... So you definitely felt that way. I mean, you know, it's it's hard. You know, I think looking back on the time too, uh, the more time that's between it, it's harder to know how much of it was just my own, you know, being. I like to be agreeable, and I think that's good for assistants, um, especially editorial assistants, because I think in a lot of ways you are supposed to buffer the person, the editor. Uh, you and I, I was asked in my opinion, but at the end of the day, I also knew that. It's not my say. It's not my, you know, I don't have the control over what we're buying and what we're not. Um, and I do think all of those things caused an environment where I felt like I couldn't necessarily speak up. And there are a couple of small moments. I mean, I didn't have a moment like the Shertrisha incident in the book, thankfully. Um, but I have heard of similar things like that happening with other Black assistants. And I do know, again, having worked in the posi that position and having been fortunate enough to have bosses who did care what I thought, 
um, more than I think a lot of other, uh, frankly, I will say, I think more than uh, other assistants had. Uh, it's still, I still felt like I couldn't do or say that much. And I think that that comes with, in general, any kind of company like that, where it's like there was an assistant, you're support, supposed to work your way up and earn it. But it's also, you know, I think there's a benefit to making these environments um, or conducive to young people speaking up and especially young people of color speaking up because you just have more opinions, more honest opinions rather than everyone saying, yes, yes, this book is wonderful. Yes, and then it goes all the way to, you know, going becoming a finished book. And then there's someone who points out, oh, well, there's something in this book that is problematic, or I don't feel that this book, you know, X, Y, Z, what, which we've seen with other books in the past. And I think that a lot of times that can be prevented or at least addressed earlier on if everyone feels like they have the right and the space to speak up. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. And, you know, I think that a lot of times it's the way it's presented. Like um, years ago, there was an ad that ran was when they were running full page ads in the New York Times for books, but that decade ago, decades yes. ago. Okay. And I remember calling somebody at one of the publishers and I said, you know, because we had were working with the author as well. And I said, I just don't think that this ad is really saying it. This is what I think. You know, and it, he says, I'm going to bring this up in a meeting. And the publisher walked in and held it up and go, isn't this the best ad you've ever seen? And it's. Yes. That is exactly, exactly the thing that happens. That's so on point. And that you're leading, people are leading the conversation and already have an expectation for what they want you to say. So how can you say, sorry, I cut you off. I just, that's exactly it. And it's so subtle, right? It's so mm -hmm. subtle. And I've now, I have done this now since I've seen that in my career, I always say, what do you think of this? Yes. And I want to leave myself more open to, I, there are times I come up with an idea that I think is great all weekend. And by Monday at 1030, it's not so great because you ask and you say, you know, like this is, and so you're not moving in the wrong direction. And I think that that's where a lot of the conversation on many levels stops besides just the conversation about race is we think that this is the way we've always done it. And this is right. And I think during the pandemic, we're seeing a lot of where we're going to have to rethink of they're gonna to have to be greater managers at middle level because it's not just the top anymore. It's you're, into, you're dealing with a lot less people all day long. Yes, exactly. That's so true. And I think that it really, I mean, it, it needs to start, it's, it's everywhere, but I also think it's important to look at the, the ground level too. I think mm -hmm. the people who are, are coming in because I also think another part of it is, especially as a young black woman, I think having other Black women or just other Black people uh, in editorial would have also made me feel more comfortable and like I could speak up and just speak up as a person rather than, you know, also that possibly my thoughts being seen as the thoughts for all Black people. I think the more, the more diverse, the more numerous different kinds of people are, I think just the, again, the more open and uh, more comfortable, I don't know what the word is, but just easier to speak up in that kind mm -hmm. of space. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, people have spoken about this, you know, on an ongoing basis of this is the way we felt. I remember one of my friends was in publishing. She's not there anymore. And she said that uh, she went to a diversity meeting. It was her, the people from the messenger room, the people from the mail room. And she said she looked around and she's like, systemic change is not happening in this meeting. Like this is just not going to happen. And it was, it drove home to me. And I think I heard that six or seven years ago. And she said, it's just, there's just not going to be a place for having that conversation with somebody who worked really hard too. You moved up to an assistant editor position while you were there. And that was a big move. I mean, she got out of the assistant alley. She got to move to a different seat, everybody. It was like, <laughs> yes. and when, when you were there, did you see a path forward for yourself? Like you were on a track at that point till you went to the ladies room. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that track led me right into the Acer. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's funny because that was really supposed to be. I remember I had been in um, in Italy. I'd taken a trip with some friends. Another pro, uh, pro of working and this job is I had vacation time for the first time in my life, so I got to do things and get paid for it. And um, but I remember coming back and one of my work wives, who I mentioned, telling me that oh, like you know, we're all, a lot of us are getting promotions because a lot of us had been there at this point mm -hmm. for a couple years or more um, as editorial assistants. And I remember standing in the airport and being like, 
oh my God, finally, like I, I have, the boards are switched. I'm an assistant editor now. This is huge. It's a huge deal. Like I'm, I'm being serious. I, I do feel like the names are funny, but it is a big deal. And um, I remember shortly after I got back and my, my boss and I had a conversation and he gave me a book that he had started, um, that he had acquired um, and said, you know, I, I want you to take this book on. I think he'll do a great job. And um, the author's great. And I remember saying, yes, thank you. This is awesome. I was so in a lot of ways uh, thrilled that he trusted me, that my bosses trusted me to work on this title by myself. I would be launching this title by myself. Um, I would have all the interactions with authors rather than just like being like, oh, here's the edits, like here, you know, forwarding things and all those things. But I went back to my desk and I sobbed. <laughs> I, I cried to one of my coworkers who's also a writer. So I knew he would understand. And I just remember telling him like, I have this book and I know I have to be happy about it, but like, I'm not happy. Like I can't work on my own stuff. And at that time, I mean, I had started publishing, I threw myself into it, but I also was still freelancing. I was writing book reviews. I was ghostwriting. Um, I was doing all these other projects outside of work because partly I needed the money, the other money, but also I just enjoyed working on my own craft and being creative. And I knew with this new book, I wouldn't have that outlet in the same way. I'd have to focus on this, this author's book. That's what he deserved. And so it was a lot of weight. It was a lot of responsibility. And that was one of the moments, and this was before the bathroom, I should say, um, and that I alluded to having other moments where I was like, ah, publishing might not be for me. But this was one of those moments where I was like, yeah, I, this isn't my jam. Like I need to, I think I need to get out of here before mm -hmm. I like ruin this guy's book. <laughs> um, and fast forward to when I did leave, I emailed him and I felt so bad about it, but he was so supportive. He was like this author, he was like, yes, like do it. And that, that kind of made, it made it a lot easier, I think for me in a lot of ways of going out into the world, but it, it's, it's hard. It's hard to really, to decide. I mean, I know when I started, I had this idea like Nella in my book of mm -hmm. being the black female editor. I loved the idea of working on Black writers books specifically. Um, and I should add that this book wasn't a book by a Black writer and it had nothing to do with Black issues or anything like that, which I don't know if it had been something more in my alley too. I might have might have stayed longer, uh, but there's no way to know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, so many times when people are assistants, they can't wait to get promoted. And I said, just remember that there's, I have this theory that they're three years in a job. The first year is you have no idea what you're doing and everybody's telling you what to do. The second year you're doing it. And the third year you make it your own. And mm -hmm. a lot of people want to get promoted out of being an assistant. I go, well, then you're more responsible. The yes. assistant can make a mistake. The other people can't make a mistake. You're more fireable. You're more whatever. And a lot of people don't think about that. And they're just like, I want to get ahead really quickly. And I said, yeah, but if you don't have the building blocks, the building collapses later really quickly. Totally. And they don't understand totally. that. You know, it's just is that get ahead kind of thing. Did you ever feel any microaggressions or any slights? Did any of that come up when you were in the workplace there? Yeah, I mean, there were a few things. Like I, I uh, there was this book that we got in um, uh, by an author, a uh, black author who was pretty well known. Um, at least I thought well known. And I remember the conversation being like, who's heard of this author? Um, and I mean, it's, it's, it's micro in an interesting way, uh, but I definitely, if I had asked any other Black person under the sun or really any young person under the age of, I think, 30 or even under the age of 40, I think, um, a lot of people did know who this author was and this book actually went on to be somewhere else. It was bought from someone else, but it went on to be a very well-selling and good book. Um, and that kind of conversation, which goes back to, I think what you were saying earlier about like really leading the conversation in a way that precludes anyone from feeling like they can make a stance on it. Um, and I mean, I had my name in a lot of ways uh, typed, misspelled typed um, in emails with people, which like I also understand in a lot of ways, but it's like a matter of copying and pasting. And just like, I, I do feel, and I try to get at this in the book too, of like, I do feel like a lot of times black people's names are, people do not try to pronounce them right, uh, whether it's out of intent, uh, 
whether it's conscious or not, I think it still can have an effect on a person. And that's mm -hmm. something that, that got at me a little bit. And I, I did even a little give, giveaway on Twitter a few weeks or maybe months ago, where I was asking for people to, to talk about the times their name has just been butchered so, so badly. And I heard from so many Black people about that. Mm -hmm. And and so the, those are just a few few microaggressions. But I've also heard so many other horror stories, again, from other people who have had pretty hard experiences, a lot harder than my own. Yeah, of what was going on. I will say with the name of Carol, the only thing I get asked is, is there an E at the end? And that's only because of Carol King, trust yes, me. So yes. Carol King came along, no one ever asked me this question. So the <laughs> earth moved under her feet and people yes. started asking me to spell my name. So yes. there you go. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's not also when you're the only person of a race on a team at a job, you can't decide who what, you know, joins your team. So here in the book, let's get back to the book, Hazel shows up. And is it that something that you think about, oh, you're the only, and then here's Hazel. And oh my gosh, if this is a gift, may I please return it? Like, you know, this is how I'm actually feeling when this woman comes in the room. It's like, can we send her to another department? Because now she's also honing in on your boss. Like she's going to be the BFF with your boss. She's going to be the one that's hanging. She's going to be the one that's getting everything. And you're just there like, what, what I, you know, like, what did I ask for? It just came true. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, well, totally. And I think it's it's it, a lot of Nella's feelings about Hazel as the book goes on go against Nella's very being, like the code that she'd set for herself. I mean, she's really excited that Hazel's there because, I mean, for one, of course, she's the only Black person there and expects to have such a fun time, have, a, have conversations about things she can't talk about in the office. Um, but then it turns out that Hazel is just killing it like I won't give spoilers away but she is able to talk to all these people that Nella really can't stand um way better than Nella can and that really gets under her skin mm -hmm. even though she doesn't like talking to her coworkers that much she still feels um territorial and feels a way about um having worked her way like she she really was able to um I don't remember, it's terrible. I don't remember, recall if this phrase exactly is in the book, but she breaks in these, this group of white people at Wagner Books and now Hazel just comes in and she's like the new awesome black girl in the office. And I think the fact that Nella feels a way about that also makes her feel a way because she knows and has been raised, like I mentioned earlier, you're supposed to nod at other black people. You're supposed to also help other black people get into these spaces. Mm -hmm. And so for you know the, these new things happening in the office that Hazel is partly responsible for, she feels jealous. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that I know I have felt um, with other Black people in spaces, uh, frankly, and I know I've talked about this, especially with the book, with other Black people about how, where that feeling comes from mm -hmm. um, and why we feel that way and how it's messed up that we feel that way uh, and just all of the things that cause that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and where do we go from there? Like, where do we go? Is Hazel based on anyone in particular or is it a microcosm of a lot of other people? She is definitely a microcosm. I mean, I was really thinking about First and foremost, I was thinking about my own uh, personal experiences around other Black people when I was younger. I was always, a lot of the time, very anxious because I had been raised around a lot of white people. I talked a certain way at a young, at, when I was younger and still do um, that Black people in high school would say was like a white girl. Um, and a lot of those anxieties, I think, really bled into to Hazel and who she is and why Nella is initially so excited about this because finally she is she's just growing um, her own circle of Black women. She has Malika outside of work and the possibility of having this with Hazel at work is really thrilling. But then when little things start happening, like for example, and this isn't really too big of a spoiler, but Hazel and um, CJ, the mailman, are having conversations that Nella hasn't had with CJ, mm -hmm. um, partly because who, she, who knows? Nella thinks about all the reasons why, and that stresses her out. And so, so Hazel's definitely an amalgamation of that anxiety and that push pull between not worrying about being black and or uh, worrying about not being black enough and mm -hmm. also wanting to reach out and be with a black community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like both things are going on. So then there's this note that's left for Nella that says, leave Wagner now. 
<laughs> completely in your face in just those three words. And the first thing I thought of was, was the note ever something longer than that? And it was edited to just have those three words. That was my big thought. <laughs> Yeah, it, it wasn't. And I kept it short because I wanted to keep it really ambiguous. I wanted uh, the reader to wonder who left that note. And I also wanted uh, Nella to wonder who left the note. Mm -hmm. And I did feel like the more that the note said, uh, the more obvious it might be who it was. And I, I didn't want to lead the reader down a certain way. I wanted Nella's own paranoia and her own and her own anxieties to really direct the reader into making their own presumptions. And then also, I think it's fun to, um, or at least I think it's fun as the writer to think about what other readers are presuming and why. Like, why do you think this person might have left it versus this other reader who might think this person left it? And from there, the story just gets crazier and crazier. <laughs> you know, Hazel comes up a lot in the discussions, but there are other characters that went into the story, and I want to talk about them. It's her friend, and I'm going to um, not say her name correctly, is Malik, Mal okay, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Malika. I've also gotten Malika. <laughs> I'm going to do it wrong, so I, I'm ceding to you. So what about her? Like, um, let's talk about her friendship with her, what ends up happening, because she's an outlet for her to go out to lunch with, talk about mm -hmm. what's going on in the office. Yeah, yeah. It was really important for me to have Malika in the book because, I mean, Wagner can be a very uh, suffocating, uh, stagnant place. And I wanted to show Nella in a space where she has agency. Um, and she's still, of the two, Malika is still the, the fiery one, the one who uh, goes there a lot more <laughs> than Nella will. But Nella also follows Malika down that those paths, those conversations about you know, whether or not uh, this is problematic or that's problematic or what, what Black Twitter is talking about. And all of those things, uh, I really wanted to show what's at stake for Nella and why it's important for her to um, you know, get, get out of, I'm trying to avoid spoilers, but why it's important for her to yes. succeed versus, mm -hmm. you know, um, maybe going down another path. And so Malika was just such a fun character to write. I also just she's modeled after so many of my friends my my the black circle of girlfriends that i found in college um my my one of my best black friends here that i met at, um, during my mfa program she's just all of those conversations are ones that we've had me and my friends have had yeah i just pushed them together and there's also needs to be a love interest for now so let's talk about owen because i really like that owen's like this character that she's running everything by and he also loves her. He just have like that interest in mind. So where's Owen coming from? I should say Owen is loosely, very loosely based on my fiance, um, <laughs> who is a white man um, and is very, I mean, it's funny, like there, there's the moment in the book where Owen, I am talking about, or Nella is seeing Owen and Owen's exploring in the book about, you know, how he doesn't, he gets it, but he also doesn't, isn't the kind of person who would say he doesn't see race, um, which was important for me in a partner, um, if I were to be dating someone who was not a Black person, because there's a lot of stuff that comes up. There are a lot of conversations, hard conversations that we have been having, um, especially last year, and I wanted to show how that affects a person like Nella um, in the space where she's already got her circle with Malika outside of work. Um, she's already got her circle at Wagner Books. And then she has this other circle with her boyfriend, Owen. And uh, Owen has, of course, in his own ways, privilege as a white male, but also is like his own boss at a tech startup, which is a completely different dynamic from what Nella is experiencing at Wagner Books. And that's really important too, because I think that affects your conversations and how you kind of uh, want to tell talk about your job. I mean, Nella feels in a lot of ways like I mean, it's like why don't you just leave, right? Owen's like this job is it, not a publishing person, and and I've also had similar conversations with my partner when I'm explaining all the publishing jargon even now. Um, and talking to someone outside of that space is is really important, and I wanted to show show that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not everybody's doing the same thing. Like people are going to be going back and forth and doing different things. Which character was the easiest for you to write? Which one came to you just like, yeah, I can do this? Yeah, I think um, Diana and Kendra Ray, to mm -hmm. be honest, okay. were really easy for me. I think Diana, for the most part, was maybe a little easier because 
Um, I, I grew up in, uh, not for the full time, but I, my family was in Jack and Jill when I was a kid, um, which is a, a started uh, as an a kind of elite organization for um, upper middle class, uh, well-to-do Black people in the United States to have a space to congregate. So like Black people weren't being accepted into these spaces, um, the white spaces, so they were able to make their own spaces. Um, but I also wanted to explore what happens when like that becomes um, that that excludes other Black people and other uh, certain ideas and how in a lot of ways that might cause someone to feel superior or feel uh, just certain ways of moving up are better than other certain ways of moving up. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted to explore that dynamic between Diana and Kendra Ray. Uh, Diana having been raised this one way and Kendra Ray uh, go, having her own experiences. And for me, they also just represent, um, they were super easy to write because they represent to me these two forces at work that I've always been thinking about, especially in the last six years. Um, again, about like, how do we get progress? Do we just mm -hmm. kind of uh, move through the, the system and hope that once we get to the top, we can make change or do we it's just be ourselves. Can we just open our mouths and say what we're thinking and not shy away from it? And so they very much have lived in my mind, I think, years before I started writing this book. And is that a lot of what's happening on Black Twitter? Is people are just saying their own minds? Is that a lot of what's happening there besides other I, conversations? Yeah, I think so. But I also think that there's still, I, yes, I think that people are speaking their minds on Black Twitter, but I also think that there, there's still people telling other black people still telling other black people not to say certain things. Like I still think there is uh, a lot of times there, there, there is a community there, but then also the community can be cannibalistic, which mm -hmm. is really unfortunate. And, and that's another aspect of this book too. Mm -hmm. Yes, the cannibalistic, it definitely does come <laughs> up. Yeah, we're going a different direction later, folks. Trust me. Get to page whatever, and we're going to flip the scenario. Let's stay here for a second, though. So growing up, you lived in a very white area in Connecticut. You were, you know, it's sort of token, like, you know, in many, many ways. And then you go to New York, University of North Carolina, and you found more people like you. What was that experience like? Because once again, it's like Hazel, like the Hazel's the new person who comes in, but is everybody really like you? And I think you start saying, you yeah. know, what do what happens to me? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think like me in the sense that, I mean, I'll never, I've never met anyone like me, but, but those kind of, uh, those conversations where, I mean, talking, even the way I speak, like I, it took me a little while to find that group of people who um, speak the way I do, not that that's always important, but I think for me, I needed to, I needed it when I was younger because I had had anxiety about uh, participating too much, about speaking a certain way. And so that was wonderful. The conversations that we had about black hair, um, mm -hmm. I was relaxing my hair at the time, but I had other friends who had braids. I had friends who were natural. Uh, just being around those conversations. And then my senior year, I lived with um, seven other black women, which was amazing. And just being in the room and having those conversations about products and, and hair and uh, pop culture references, and but then old school, like 60s references, like all of those kind of, not nerdy, but just non-mainstream um, mm -hmm. conversations about pop culture were really, really valuable for me. And I think, uh, I mean, I think about it a lot too, in terms of like, at the time when I was in college, um, Issa Rae's YouTube TV series was the, it was the first time I saw it. I think it had come out maybe a little before that, but um, The Misadventures of Awkward Black Girl mm -hmm. also, I think, directly fed into that of like, here's another option. Here's another way to be Black mm -hmm. um, and have your own series or to be on TV or not. Um, I mean, there are so many different ways to be Black and having that group of Black friends and then also having it secure and these other things that popped up over the years have has been really helpful and wonderful for me. And I'm excited for future young people to have that experience too. I think the show Blackish brought like so much to, of the culture to mind. So good. Well. 
I yes. just loved, I loved all of them. Like the, 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 the you, know, you think I watch television? Yes, I do. But it was, you know, mixish, the whole thing about what was going on. And I, mm-hmm. it's going to sound really crazy in a sense, but I've learned a lot watching that show. And you've learned a lot yeah. from the conversations that the family is having. And I just think it's like so interesting because it sort of opens your mind and you may, think one way but then you're seeing like okay this is what these people are saying and right. what they're thinking and what they're doing and everybody's just people but how can I be more accept- accepting of people and seeing this you understand being more accepting exactly you know? exactly totally and and I think the more the more exposure you have blackish is a great example I think the more you see things like this this is why this is literally why representation matters mm-hmm. like just having expanding your idea of what blackness means um being a young person means all of these things I think are really important to to take note of and see yeah it also happens in season two of the bold type <laughs> like, I sound like such <laughs> are they paying you <laughs> no they're not but it's just like this thing they you know what it is when I'm doing email at night or whatever I put something on so I feel like I'm not alone and now I'm, I'm the bonding same way with these three girls, like I'm bonding with them. But there is a whole conversation about this one woman feels like she's being slighted and she's mm-hmm. black and she says, this is what's going on. And you're seeing this experience. And I just found it was very, very interesting to me because look, I grew up in a very white world. I'm not like, you know, this is exactly the way it was. Mm-hmm. And for me to be understanding and hearing even from a sitcom on television, I've now noted too, is it's enlightening. And when you totally. read books and whatever, it's, it's just a different experience, you know? Totally. I don't want to sound like I'm in school or something watching TV, but the way a program is presented these days and the way the subjects are handled, it was something that was on obviously two seasons ago, which was two years ago, which is now a current conversation now. And I think that's what I found was so interesting about it is they were dealing with this in such a smart, good way then of something that now we're feeling is this like didactic thing that we need to be doing, blah, 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 you know? Yes, totally. Oh, so well said, Carol. Yeah. So twice as good as a mantra to Nella, was that resounding in your head that you, when you wrote, when you were writing this book, were you thinking this book is going to have to be twice as good because what I'm trying to do here? Yes. Um, but in a, in an additional way, of course, as a black author, as a black writer, but I think also because I'd worked in publishing and I told people that I was quitting to write this book, which is crazy. I think I did it because I needed that to feel this extra push to actually do it, you know, when you set deadlines for yourself. And, um, but yeah, I think that having worked in publishing, having seen what it's like to be on the other side, knowing the volume of books you get in, the volume of really good books you get in, but you still can't buy for X, Y, Z. There are so many factors like, oh, we just bought this book that's in a similar vein, or oh, all of those things. Um, That's already an obstacle in itself. And so to add the layer of being a, a Black writer, being a Black writer who'd worked in publishing, who is writing about publishing, um, and I consciously, while I was writing, wanted to make sure I was not specifically throwing anyone under the bus because that was not what I wanted to be doing. And really wanting to make sure, though, that I was conveying the, my genuine experience and my genuine, um, I mean, not literal genuine experience, but the, that just that, that weight and that kind of uh, environment, what that does to someone was really my, my goal. And it's hard to walk the line between like all of those things. And so definitely felt that way. And I think also I felt that way in general uh, as a young person. Um, I, I do feel like I have to uh, be extra nice and be extra agreeable and go that extra step all the time. And I don't know how much of it is because I just genuinely enjoy doing it, which I do. I love talking to people. I love helping other people Mm -hmm. Um, and being an assistant. It was, again, I mentioned earlier, so agreeable, it was great. But I also don't know how much of that is like that versus this pressure I feel. Mm -hmm. And I think that that gray area, um, just as that question of was that, was that weird thing or that look racist? Like, I don't know. And I'll never know. And I think that never knowing is something that um, definitely I've been talking a lot with other Black people as well, Mm -hmm. that kind of ghost of a feeling. Yeah, the ghost of a feeling going there. You know, Nell at one point is giving advice to one of Publishing House's top authors. I love this moment. And she doesn't share the same opinion as as her boss. And she puts herself really out there. 
And during the publishing process on this book, were you looking for that kind of critical feedback? Were you looking for somebody to say, no, this is not going to work if you rephrase this this way, whatever. Was that what something you were going for? Yeah, yeah. You mean in general? Just yeah, in general. Like, like, you know, like, yeah, I mean, I... I, when you're working on anything, I feel like when you're in a bubble like that so much, it can be easy to, to not see your blind spot. So I was, I was very open to edits and I wanted also, I mean, there was, there's a lot of nuance in this, this book. There's a lot of questioning with not necessarily answers like about how, what is the best way to handle this conversation with your boss and this white author? Like, what is this? There was no, there are no easy answers to a lot mm -hmm. of the questions in the book, but I wanted to make sure I was posing these questions mm -hmm. clearly and succinctly and um, genuinely in a way that readers um, feel that they're still getting something valuable out of it, out of it, even if there is no kind of, uh, this book doesn't end in a way that it's like, all right, now you can get this book and they'll know exactly how to handle this situation. Like that's not how this works, but I do want it to, to start these conversations. And so, yeah, making sure that uh, certain moments, certain phrasings uh, uh, really hit the right way and really making sure they sound authentic and, and true to this world of publishing and true to the world of a young black woman living in New York in 2018. Like all of that was really important to me. Mm -hmm. But you're glad you didn't said it in 2022 or 2020. In 2021. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to do that. 2020, 2021. No, this that would not have been as much fun a book. That would <laughs> have been work from home. I know. <laughs> And if she gets a note, <laughs> it's like, where did this note come from? Actually, it would probably be creepier so it snuck into our home. Totally creepier, totally creepier. So the book, okay, for the audience that's watching that has not read the book, the book could continue in this one direction. She's going to get promoted. She's going to become the editor in chief. But oh no, folks, we go in a different direction. We pivot and it turns into more of a thriller. It turns more into a horror story. What drew you to make that happen? I mean, we've got this girl that's just moving along in her career and then all of a sudden, whoosh, we're gonna go over this way. Tell us how that happened. Yeah, I mean, I have to say first, I am a big horror, big suspense sci-fi fan, big Lifetime movie fan. So <laughs> anything that just like goes, <laughs> that is honestly one of my favorite forms of entertainment. Um, thinking specifically like Rosemary's Baby, uh, that ambiance, the gaslighting, of course, the slow burn. Um, Night of the Living Dead was also a very big movie for me when I first saw it, uh, especially the ending. Um, because I should say also when I started writing this book, I knew how it would end. I oh. knew, yeah, I, I I knew where it was gonna go. I just wasn't sure exactly how I was gonna get there yet. Um, and it, it, I think the end in a lot of ways matches with my worldview. Uh, when people read it, they will know what that means um, in a lot of ways. But uh, yeah, I, I knew that I would go in that direction. And I also just love stories that take kind of an everyday sort of situation. I mean, The Twilight Zone is another mm -hmm. classic for one of my favorites. Um, they take this ordinary uh, world, this space, and then it slowly goes off in this whole other direction and there's mm -hmm. this other element and a lot of times and all of the time with Twilight Zone these stories have something to add to the conversation about like our social the problems with our community of the social ills of society and I think that those kinds of stories I mean get out also uh really speak to um I don't know they just speak so beautifully to these problems in a way that feels a lot um easier, a lot chewable, more chewable uh, <laughs> to handle versus being just a straightforward uh, literary exploration of a Black girl working in publishing, which uh, this could have been, but that also wouldn't have been me. Um, mm -hmm. I am I am that hard left turn, so. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's hard left, everybody. And with almost no directional, you're going hard left, just <laughs> so you know. You're gonna go right across the road when this happens, you know. Um, <laughs> There are four parts to the book and there it's like part one, two, three. Was it always four? Was it always defined like that? Or did that happen later on in the process? Uh, this structure has been, it was so fluid. I mean, I love books that play with structure, parts, times, character voices, all of those things. Uh, Toni Morrison, Sula, 
um, can't think of other, I was a big Jodi Picoult fan as a young person. Like, I, I love those kinds of stories and getting another angle, um, but that's also really hard to do. So I wrote the first uh, draft of this just through Nella. Um, the other characters were in her head, but we couldn't see them necessarily the way that we see them in this, the final book that you have. And uh, it took a lot of playing around with, you know, if we know this part, this, uh, if we know this part at this point, um, how interesting will this be later on when we find mm -hmm. out this? It was a lot of that kind of puzzling. So it, it took a while and it took a lot of time with my wonderful agent um, and a lot of time with my wonderful editor too. And I, I wrote, even after we sold the book, I definitely wrote at least one additional section last summer um, from scratch. Uh, because it felt like from all the feedback I've gotten, I just knew that there needed to be another moment that um, explored a specific thing. So, so this has been a, a, a constantly fluid uh, process. Yeah, people have to understand that you don't just hand the book in and it's done. There's so many different, you're going to read wish. a lot of times. <laughs> lot of I time. hope so. I hope so. <laughs> so you earned an MFA in nonfiction. What drew you mm -hmm. in that direction at the beginning? And you had your MFA before you went into publishing, correct? Yes. Before you went to a publisher. Mm -hmm. What drew you to do nonfiction? Yeah, it actually was a matter of me applying to both and getting waitlisted for fiction. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I know it's so glamorous. It's even less glamorous too when you find out that, I mean, I applied to an MFA program. I knew I wanted to write, I wanted to explore that, but a lot of it came from the fact that I didn't want to live at home. Um, immediately after graduating, I'd been in North Carolina for a while and I just felt like I needed to be out in the city not, and not in Connecticut. And so I applied to the new school. I got in for nonfiction and waitlisted for fiction. And it was kind of a matter of, I mean, I thought I then got into fiction, but I remember thinking to myself, I mean, the other thing about it is I would have been, it would have been a three-year program rather than four years, which I think for me, I would have wanted the full two years both ways, but that's not how it worked. But another thing was just, I'd been writing fiction for a lot of my life and I had just started writing them fiction in uh, undergrad. I finally started um, doing research that I enjoyed. Um, I started inter interviewing people for random pieces for classes I was taking at um, UNC Chapel Hill. So I was really excited to get to learn more and just throw myself into it. And I'm really glad I did because a lot of the, the backbone for this book of Nella's um, own experiences, her worldview, uh, the anxieties I mentioned earlier of Hazel and uh, Nella's growing up in white spaces, uh, that was all stuff that I processed and worked my way through while I was writing personal essays at the new school. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was going back and forth. It's yeah. But I think that writing nonfiction, it informs a whole different way of thinking. It, the totally. research and how you do the flow of the story and things like that as well. So I also have to bring up that when you left your job in publishing, you started working in a cupcake shop, which has a total different <laughs> skill set. And my question is, did you just sell or did you have to frost the cupcakes? Because <laughs> frosting is my nemesis in baking. Maybe you have to frost. Oh my, God. my cakes are always like this, like there's never <laughs> pieces going together. So did you have to frost? This is my big question. Yes, and I. that's partly why I had to leave. No, I mean, I, I was not uh, expecting the frosting part until I, you know, and even when I did know about the frosting, I thought, oh, this will be really easy. It's so hard. I had the pastry bag. We had like four different kinds of frosting and each one came out in a different way. And mine always looked like little poops. <laughs> and like, I was like, there was no way I can do this. It's like a, it's a, a well-known coffee shop downtown in Manhattan and tourists come from all over the land to get these beautiful cupcakes they see on Instagram. And I'm just like, ah, um, but yeah, so I, I, I hear you hundred <laughs> yeah, percent. Yeah, it was really funny because mine always have lots of frosting on them because I'm making up for mistakes. So there's like yes. bobs of frosting, little tiny cupcake. And there's like this head thing on the top of them. It's, no it's harder than it looks folks. It is. So you have this experience working in publishing. So as you're going through the process, does that help or do you know too much? Like you, like yeah. they're saying something and you're going, I know what that really means. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's both. It's definitely both. I think the part for me that helped and hurts, well, I guess I'll say where it, it um, so let me go back. When I was uh, trying to find an agent, 
I, that part was very new to me. I knew agents obviously after they were working with writers as an assistant when I was working publishing, but the whole other side of it of like getting an agent was very new to me. And so I was talking to a lot of friends about it. I was reading uh, blogs about it. I was really trying to make sure that that part I, I learned. And, and I think the hardest thing for me um, was, you know, knowing that everything again, uh, everything's affected by other things. And so you can have an idea that you really love and uh, you know you enjoy writing, but at the end of the day, there are so many other reasons why an agent might not want to represent it or mm -hmm. a publisher might not want to buy it and all of those things. And I think that the, the part that helped was knowing again, how, the volume and how many really good things we read that we just couldn't buy for various mm -hmm. reasons. So that, that helped me in a weird way, if that makes sense, um, in terms of like, if this doesn't go my way, like. Mm -hmm. I know it's, there are so many other factors involved as well. I think the part that was hard was really kind of, I mean, gosh, I, I, this is weird, but the thing that was hard was the, that I thought would be, no, that's not it either. Sorry. I'm, <laughs> but yeah, I'm edit, like, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, no, I have, I have one thing that I, I know that was hard is, I think just knowing that there are, hmm. I'm so sorry. Go I ahead. have, I have a thought though. <laughs> it's not the tip of my tongue. Wait, don't worry. Oh, I think the thing that, that was hard is the, the cover conversations. Um, which like wasn't hard in the sense of like getting to a cover I liked. I mean, this one was, um, this one, yes, <laughs> this one. was one of the earlier covers that the U.S. landed on. And I was like, yes, immediately that. Um, but I think also just like knowing all of, like, I also know that there are other iterations that like the publishing house is working on that I haven't seen and mm -hmm. I probably never will see as an author but like when I was working in publishing like I remember me and my bosses would like talk about covers and like we would talk about them and they would maybe never make it to mm -hmm. the author mm -hmm. um, until we had finally figured something out and so I think that kind of like oh but like there's more information um, that I know you guys are talking about and I know I shouldn't be in these conversations but I still kind of am curious what you're thinking. And I think that's extended throughout um, the process. It's just, I know a lot, but then I think that's also a problem because sometimes I, I get too much information. I think mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, wait, I don't know if I need to know that. I don't know if I need to see every single thing. And just like navigating that because I think I thought before I would be a lot stronger in some ways of like seeing certain things, like I can take all of it. And it's like, sometimes like, no, I don't, I don't need to see all of it. <laughs> I don't need to see everything. I don't need to see everything. Was this always the title going in? Was this your working title? Yes. It was always the title. It was and the cover, the this is their first round on it, on the cover? It was between this one and a different cover. And those were the two they sent. And it was a resounding for this one uh, immediately. And I love the comb earrings and I've seen you wearing comb earrings. I just love this. So I just love getting to see that here. <laughs> it's really great. I'm so, so happy with it. I, I still am so obsessed with this cover. <laughs> it really, it really is terrific. It really, it's, it, it says a lot like this, this cover folks, when you want, when you read is a story unto itself, like just looking at the cover here. Totally. So the other black girl is being adapted on the screen for Hulu, you know, my new favorite channel. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So are you involved in the process? Are you involved in what's going on? Yeah, yep. I'm co-writing the TV series um, with Rashida Jones mm -hmm. and it's been so much fun. It's a lot of work uh, and a lot of juggling between this world and then the TV world. Um, but it's been a lot of fun. I am watching a lot of TV, uh, <laughs> not the bold type yet, but um, <laughs> other things that, you know, uh, shows that, are, I mean, this, this show I think will be unlike a lot of stuff because it's hard, it was hard to find cops for the book. So the show will be, it was, has also been an interesting talking about the language and um, the kind of vibe it's gonna be. But it's been a lot of fun to just mm -hmm. think about everybody 
expanding and knowing more about Owen and knowing more about Malika, knowing more about the editors and the characters at Wagner Books, and then of course learning more about Nella. Mm -hmm. And also it's what ends up on the page in the script is very different than what happens in the book. It's enter here, go here, blah, 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 dialogue. Yeah. It's and I've been so different. <laughs> Deadline, um, Deadline.com has been publishing a lot of scripts recently from shows. And it's very interesting to go back and watch like Mayor of Easton and see exactly East Down and see exactly how the script lays out. Yeah. And I'm always fascinated by that. And I remember when The Wire was being written, George Pelicano said, it's sort of like you're um, a general contractor and you're bringing in somebody just to paint the woodwork and I'll bring in Dennis Lehane just to do this part. And I'll bring so-and-so in just to do this part because in order to get it to work, there's certain things that certain people do well and that's gonna make the story better. And I think that the screenwriting mm. process is gonna be interesting for you because it's your own work, but it's also this new form and yes. learning the new form and seeing how it works. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm literally learning as I go, like mm -hmm. about like Googling terms, um, wondering like, how do I say this in a script? Like it's so much easier to say a lot of things in a book, you're just saying it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, having a different audience too. I mean, it's not viewers, like I know what I'm trying to say, but making sure that it's conveyed to the people who are filling in all of the other things like you mentioned. I think that's a great way to describe it of the characters mm -hmm. and the, the sets and all of those things and the music, um, making sure that the people who, those people understand my vision so that mm -hmm. then viewers take that translated vision that they get and then they understand it. It's like an extra layer that's mm -hmm. really fascinating. And there's a layer in the writing and then there's a layer in picking the actors and the actresses. You know, totally. I watched the Friends reunion and it was very interesting to hear how long it took them. Well, a lot of things on that didn't work for me, but how the beginning of how the show came together and how they were casting each of the people for the show and how that all came to be besides the writing, because they knew what they wanted to do, but you've got to have right. the right people to say those. And in the book, yeah. it's just words on a page. Here it's right. got to be that actor really is not working for here and it's not going to be, be holding the story well. Absolutely. And I think the thing that, I mean, I've been thinking about that a lot too, while watching shows, doing my homework, um, if you will, um, and thinking about characters because that can make a big difference mm -hmm. in whether or not you connect. I mean, my, my fans and I will be watching certain things and we'll be like, this is great, but like this actor is not doing it for me and it, it mm -hmm. takes away from the whole show mm -hmm. uh, and to really get that right can be really hard and I'm I don't even I, I don't even know how <laughs> you have your dream for a person and then they're not available it's not like a character you can just write in you've got to get these people available and with COVID so much has been pushed back that mm -hmm. it's like okay do you get the right people to be in the right spots I think it's just gonna right. be very it's very very interesting to see not only is the screenplay different but it's but it's also putting the whole thing together making it a bigger package yeah um, yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm really excited for it. And, you know, even with the pandemic, everything happening last year, mm -hmm. we have been as full speed ahead as you can possibly be. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been really exciting. But you're right. It's also like, a matter of timing. And, mm -hmm. and is it worth waiting or like mm -hmm. trying to sweeten the pot, all of those things. And I'm, I'm glad those decisions are not over my head. I'm just- Over your head. <laughs> it's even like there's a character on the on the Good Doctor and she had two more years on her contract, but she just didn't want to do anymore. So they had to write her out and write her out well. So she could come yes. back and guest star. So you're constantly thinking about if they can't be there for the whole thing, what are you going to do? It's just, it's a d totally different process. But now you had a lot more control over the multicast recording of the audiobook because that was a completely fabulous experience. You've got four voices narrating that. So Did good. you help decide about the narrators and were you involved in that whole process? Yeah, yeah, I was involved a little bit. My, um, I mean, SNS Audio, Simon & Schuster Audio emailed me and my agent last summer. Oh my God, I don't even know what time what time that was, but a uh, wonderful email just about potential people for each uh, character. And I, they gave a bunch of names, I think, for each person. And I remember looking at it being like, oh, this is so exciting. Like, you know, this will be easy. It was actually pretty, I mean, it, it was easy in some respects because everyone they suggested was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but 
uh, I took a lot of time to, to look up every single person. I knew Asia Naomi King from my love of how to get away with murder and uh, the voice of Nella. And I, I thought that um, she already, I already knew her voice. I knew uh, who she was in a bit, in a, in a way. And so I knew she'd be great. But then I looked her up as well, just to do my due diligence. And I found this wonderful YouTube video of her accepting an award at, um, I think it was maybe an NAACP image award. It was, it was some kind of, some award show. And she gave just the most beautiful speech about um, representation and being this person in this business. And it, I don't even remember exactly the topic of it, but it was, it spoke to me and I was like immediately like, yes, I love that she's talking about this. She could have just given this simple speech like, thank you, I'm so happy and gone. But no, she was using it as a, a way to speak um, about representation and being a black mm -hmm. woman. And so so those are the kind of things I noticed. And with the other women, I, I knew I'd known, um, I, I looked at their experience and, and listened to other audiobooks that they had narrated if, if that was applicable. and. And I just really got to know their care, their voices uh, in a way. And then it, that really helped me make decisions on narrowing it down. And they're wonderful. I can't, I, I'm listening to it now and it's so good. <laughs> like we, we wrote this book. And I'm gonna make sure we link to, there are three um, videos on YouTube of them recording the sessions. And I wanna make sure where our listeners and viewers can be able to take a look at those as well. Because I think it was very interesting to hear them actually doing the recording of the, the, the yes. book at the same time. So you've listened to it. Um, do you usually listen to audiobooks? Is that something you do a lot? No, it's not. And uh, I, I think I might do it more often. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so here's a question. What's next for you? Besides, you probably have 20 more interviews to do because I know you're, <laughs> going, to be, you're going to be on Good Morning America. You're going to be in conversation um, for the BNN event. So what else is beyond that, beyond writing the screenplay? Is that gonna take up most of your time that there's not time really for another writing project? Yeah, I mean, it's it's all hard to know in terms of when, when things will pick up with one thing versus the other. It's all a juggling act in a lot of ways. But uh, yeah, TV show is taking up a lot of my brain space right now, but I, I have been thinking a lot about book two, uh, not in actual, like I'm gonna sit down and start writing, but just, thinking about the world, thinking about the characters. I know there'll be black characters living in the US um, in this time or sometime around this time. Um, uh, and that's pretty much all I've really set my mind on. But it's, it's I wanna make sure that I go into it as clear-minded as possible uh, without letting this book inform that book too much mm -hmm. necessarily. Because I, I wanna make the decision for book two independently of feeling pushed in a certain direction or this and that, you know what I mean? Like I want it to just be as organic as possible. I don't know how possible that is, but we'll see. <laughs> but there's no reason just like run to the ladies room again. There's no reason. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to have to factor into this one. I, mean, I know. Down, you're not going to find the person in the ladies' room. Well, that, could be, that could be a good book, though. I go to the bathroom, my own bathroom, and there's a stranger in the bathroom. <laughs> there, you you? there you go. And it's not a worker. It's like, who's this person? What's going yeah. on? And you know what? With the end of your book, that's entirely possible. <laughs> Look, <laughs> anything is possible. <laughs> it has been such a pleasure. I've seen you a number of times, you know, pre-publication talking about this book, but I was so looking forward to the opportunity to talk to you today and just get through a lot of these questions. It was so, so much fun. So thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Carol. This was such a blast. So many new questions and you really just such a delight. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much. And to our readers, we look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks too.